If you have ever been out to Moab, Utah, you will see a couple of dirt bikes. You see a lot of ATVs, all-terrain vehicles, the small ones. And then if you think about bigger real cars, so to say, which ones do you see there? The Jeep Wrangler, because this one is still the real off-road deal. And we'll have it here today in Germany at Autogefühl, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars with Thomas. Take a look at the exterior, the interior, and of course the driving experience in this new generation of the Jeep Wrangler, the JL. Let's see what it delivers for us here today. Full HD, full screen, and full length. Let's go. Thanks to the folks at Jeep, they got me an ocean blue Wrangler. That's of course my favorite color right here. Looks amazing. This version here is called Sahara. So of course named after the very famous desert. This one is basically a top spec, top trim level of Wrangler. But of course, there are also those very base specs available, which are used rather for the very rugged off-road driving. However, no matter which version you go for, you can always use this car for off-road driving, also for serious off-road driving. I will soon also give you those off-road features in the numbers. The front of the new generation you see here, this one here features this very long bumper here also in the, um, uh, in the very front. That's of course it's totally different to any other car you see on the market than this typical vertical front grille that has been there since the Villas MB Jeep. Have you seen our episode of that? I was driving the very old military version once and also comparing to the previous generation of this vehicle here. That's also an episode you should enjoy. The headlamps also come optional with LED now or then with zero equipment as for this one because you already get it in, in then when you have those top trim versions they always come then with the LED light. And you can release the front hood right here. We'll also soon do that for you. LED daytime running light is placed right there. The length is at four meters 88 or 16 foot for the four door version or five door and four meters 33 or 14 foot two for the three door version. So depending on the de definition, you know, if you take the rear hatch as another door, it's five door or four door. And the other one is two door or three door. But the main difference is there are two different lengths. One that has some space for passengers here in the rear and the other one that is just shorter and better for off-roading, for true off-roading, because you know, um, of course the uh, descending and the approaching angle is a little bit different and so on. So short wheelbase, of course, better for off-roading somehow. This one here then, if you wanna have some passengers. Then a contrasting side mirror cap to this ocean blue color. Those ones here are 18 inch rims and they still look small because of those you know, big rubber tires. Those were also somehow off-road capable, of course, and they also change the driving feeling if you have so much rubber still on the tires left. And you can be really sure that you do not damage those rims because you just have so much tire around to protect it. Really interesting for sure. And those are the street tires already with the Rubicon version. You can even get off-road tires. Those are street tires. <laughs> and that's one of the things that is cool about the Wrangler. You also find some Easter eggs, for example, at the rims. They have the, the Villiers logo here with the iconic shape. And of course, there are so many other Easter eggs you can find all over the vehicle. The classic shape, every child loves to play with a toy car or something. I also love just to you know, play with those toy cars here when I was young. And then those shoulder areas here and those very flat doors. And this is also typical for Jeep Wrangler. You can take the doors out completely and you can take out the roof, even though we have the hardtop version here today. There's this hardtop. You can retract everything that you can drive all open, like a real Safari version. Then there's a soft top and a dual top, so something in between, um, depending on what you really desire. So what do you think here about our five-door Wrangler today? Wait a minute. True Jeep Wrangler fans just told me there's something missing. Ta-da! And here it is. That's the old school antenna. And you just <laughs> screw it in like this. And yes, it's wobbling around a little bit while high speed driving and so on. So 
I somehow, you know, like to have it just removed. <laughs> what do you think? You have to remove it, by the way, in the car wash. And there it is, in full glory. Old school, yeah. So what about this hard top? It's actually quite easy to remove it in the front. Remove this clamp and then they are here. One, two, three. That was it. <laughs> and then you can already take it out like this. Um, and then you basically have some Jeep convertible. <laughs> of course, the convertible with a softer will be more practical then. And you do it the same way also at the other side. It's just you always have to start with the driver's side because this part here overlaps a little bit just to make it, um, you know, also covered against rain and stuff. So always start with the driver's side and then you do the same thing with the co-driver side and to put it in again is also as easy as putting it out. And they have also simplified the process a little bit. And the only tricky thing is if you go for the rear part, there's also, you know, here in those um, in the middle uh, console, there's always some tools available. And there you can, and also because you need to unscrew the stuff right here, then you can also take off the rear, the whole upper rear part of the vehicle. And yes, you can see it here, even the windshield can be unmounted or folded flat in the front, like with those very old traditional military versions. That's also the reason you have those plastic protectors there that the windshield can actually just lie there. But it will be quite windy on the interior, I can promise you. In the rear, of course, with a characteristic replacement tire there, that's also the reason why the rear hatch is opening sideways. That's with the real off road vehicle. Soon we'll explain more about the trunk area. You can see those LED rear lights, the LED daytime running signature here in the rear also has this somewhat x shape we've seen also with uh, for example with the jeep renegade where they're playing around with that a little bit towing hook a really massive one here in the rear to get the car also out some or well this with this vehicle rather if you <laughs> tow someone out somewhere in this new generation here the jeep Renegade lost about 100 kilograms in weight by the way so some weight savings they have done and also to give you some off-road figures 25 centimeters of ground clearance approaching angle in the front just about 36 degrees descending angle here in the rear about 31 degrees those figures for the two-door or three-door rubicon version so that would, those would be the maximum figures that are then available here today as i said the four or five door sahara version oh and 76 centimeters of waiting depth so you won't drown with this one <laughs> so I told you you can almost unclamp everything <laughs> with this vehicle and leave it just with the chassis and the, well you also can unclamp the front hood and here in the very front by the way there's no help to um, open this one you just have to do it manually basically, basically to flip it to the sides and then no hydraulic struts because that would be also not suitable for a rugged vehicle. This one here today, the 2.2 liter diesel with 200 horsepower, that would be the main engine for Europe. Then there's also a three liter V6 diesel with 264 horsepower and predominantly for the US, there are the petrol engines, two liter four cylinder with 271 horsepower or 3.6 liter V6 with 290 horsepower. All there with the eight-speed ZF gearbox when you have an automatic version and by the way the towing capacity is 1.5 tons for the two-door and 2.5 tons for the four-door version. Let's take a look at the interior together. You see how slim those doors are, so you can very well look to the outside side from the inside. And then we have, for example, door openers from the inside, which look like the clamps we have on the front hood. Very nice. Electric window support. Just a net here for securing some stuff at the inside of the doors. This one, by the way, another proof that you can also just set those doors free. Then you have basically a sill here to get inside, side step, also an off-road feature, 
but you know also used for lifestyle purposes <laughs> in this case this is the steering wheel the interior has been modernized soon we'll get to the infotainment functions but you can see the whole interior is you know we really a vertical setup and totally different than from other modern SUVs or something round gauges soon more details to that those seats are of course high and upright and the Sahara it only comes with animal skin of course you can also get fabric seats especially in those base versions don't sweat on them so much then manual control for the seat and you can see they have definitely modernized and cleaned up the interior a little bit but they also here stayed true to the original characteristics and one look here again by the way from this perspective to this top part as I've shown you you can also remove them now let's get inside and it is really a vehicle you can also use those handles here you have to climb in and for for your feet um, this is totally okay it's a little bit you know unusual not to have like a separate front area to put your left uh, foot on if you have an automatic gearbox and you know those um, you know those secure uh, fabric here for to hold the doors when you close the door then it comes close or hits well hits your uh, lower leg that can be a little bit distracting while driving just to mention that a moment is 86 or 6 with 1 and leaves plenty of headroom still that's absolutely no problem also for taller people it's actually no problem to sit here the steering column can be adjusted in height and reach with a smooth process the seat by the way is all the way back already so that's the far far as it goes and then you can pump it up you all but you already sit so high um, at least I don't really need it this party in the front controls the lumbar support I use you using lumbar support I never do that but I know guys who always push them all the way in I think it just depends on the body and with this strap right there you control the angle then of the back part of the seat it's a comfortable and high seating position and such a unique view especially out there to the front and I want to show you again when I close the door how easy it look it is to look from the inside just the way down interior overview with a rugged strong design all vertically oriented and super flat in this perspective some contrast stitches right there you start with 3.5 screen on the left and 7 inch on the right optional then 7 inch on the left and 8.4 inch here on the right the biggest one that is available and the biggest one so far then in in this jeep wrangler heated steering wheel is also available classic climate control you can control it like this um, those rubber pads here around those ones they will get used quite quickly I suppose um, I'm not sure you know but about the build quality right there but overall they have really improved the build quality so everything looks and feels pretty solid and it's also easy to use USB-C and normal USB right there and window levers in the central part because you can obviously take out the doors so you shouldn't put anything more you really need at the doors as for the commands right there and another 12 volt power supply um, we can just remove the whole cap right there soon more these two individual screens the steering wheel also has some commands for example um, as for the cruise control on the right side and voice control on the left side or picking up the phone set temperature to 22 degrees setting temperature to 22 degrees even that works already here in the Jeep Wrangler that's quite nicely done then there's this um, Additional shifting lever for the off-road features. Soon more details to that where you can set that to. And the big shifting lever for the automatic gearbox. Again with a nice Willis Jeep here on the top as another Easter egg. Instruments left side RPM and right side speed analog. And then you can have digital speed also in the middle part, MPH or kilometers per hour, or also consumption figures and tire pressure and also what's going on with the drivetrain for example and on this left screen you can also see which driving mode you are in at the moment so 2h is rear rear drive and 4h auto i can put in as well that then would be the all-wheel drive automatic you can also use this now for street driving there won't be any consequences for that so i'm not all to talk about that while we drive and then standing still and then putting neutral then you can go to 4h part-time which is just leave the part-time out it is a permanent all-wheel drive then so that one already for off-road only 
and then 4L. This one is then the additional off-road gear reduction. It does not come standard. You have to pick uh, those, those ones or comes with the Sahara and the Rubicon for real severe off-road situations. Infotainment screen up close. Let's take a look at that map. You can see they also work on the responsiveness. You can zoom in and out on that pretty well. You can connect your phone either via Bluetooth or also Apple CarPlay is available here with the apps and Android Auto. So you also have the direct connection with the cable. That's cool to have for sure. The climate can be also accessed right here. But again, it's, I think, just easier to control it than with the lower buttons. And the rest of the middle console here, some adaptive cup holders, real manual handbrake. And then this armrest is split. The first one here for the tools, for example, for the rear roof dismount. And then there's significant amounts of space below that here. And since in the front it's not so well, so good to ha let your smartphone hanging around there, you can also put it in there with the USB port, and this also connects it to Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Both three and five door were made longer, just a little bit here in the new generation, and so we also have more legroom. Uh, as I said, the seat is all the way back, and I still can sit here. It's getting a little bit close, but for four tour adults, it works also here with the rear. Um, by the way, I'm then with my head already over the roll bar so just you know inside of this top roof part but over the roll bar with my head so think about rolling over then here hmm might not be a very good idea <laughs> what do you think hmm then also those handles right there um, with the seats itself here in the rear you cannot control that much you can of course as i shown you earlier um, control them from here to flip them you can see they move a little bit down the back part here so it's actually possible that you can pull them all the way flat well there's just a cable and here there's also a separate lever just to pull the head restraints down then you can also see better from the front to the rear that's then definitely a useful thing and this lower part here is funny that the head restraint folds on because on the inside back part there are the cup holders right there and then your armrest. You also have those window levers here in the central part even in the rear and then there's two more USB supply, two normals, two USB-C really sufficient and a real power plug to you. You can even charge laptops here for example. Let's open that rear hatch. Always fun to see and by the way this one here then also folds up. Um, if you think about slamming it back again, don't do that because then this happens. <laughs> so always just put it slowly back and then it's keeping tight. So there we go and now you have total access. This is an additional floor mat, you don't have to go for it. By the way here also on the back part it has some um, you know, terrain stamped surface, interesting details and below here you have some more space and those ones here there are some small holes you can put them in there safely that you don't lose them if you um, unmount the rear roof and you can see here by the way this one is still the the, the the roll bar because when you have removed the top roof this one will be standing freely you know as a true <laughs> convertible so to say alpine sound speakers here by the way an additional one is actually a pretty decent sound here for such a rough vehicle the length here in the trunk is well little it's definitely less than one meter in length here so because um the rear hatches will also be closing right here so it's more like 94 centimeters in length and the width here is yeah just about a meter here in width and well it's just really high so that is 80 centimeters, so it's more about 85, almost 90 centimeters in height. And that's the same over the whole trunk. And that, of course, makes it very versatile to use in this respect. Also a 12 volt power supply at the side here. And then if you want to flip those seats, you can also do it from here. If you reach over right there and then they're already flipped here, you can put this stuff down too and that works quite well with flipping it you can of course also go around depending on how you want to do it do it like this oh, here we go and so you get a very even loading surface and if we check the length here then to those rear seats 
we can also do that. So there to the end and this one is a little over 1 meter and 60. And of course you can also load longer things through in the middle. If you have the two or three door version, the short wheelbase one, you have of course a little bit less length overall, but it's more about than that the rear passenger compartment is missing. What do you think here? And I think, you know, you can still use it for all the stuff you want to transport in your everyday driving life, that's for sure. Especially like really those square dimensions in the opening. And if you, you know, just want to see a practical example, if I put a cabin trolley in here, um, see how, how lost <laughs> it is basically in this trunk. Um, so also if you compare it to, you know, a, a modern SUV or so, you don't have to make any compromises when transporting luggage. The just angular building form of this car comes handy in this case. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge. It's a special one today with the Jeep Wrangler because this car is indeed very special in so many ways. So also this driving party will be a lot of fun, I can promise you. And I want to talk about the different driving options you have, also the engine, the general feeling you get when driving this car and so on. There's really a lot to talk about. So the first thing you notice here with the new generation, it is in general a little bit more silent. Of course this car, due to the building style and this very upright windshield there in the front of you, will never be the most silent car on the, on the street. But it's a little bit more silent, a little bit better insulated than the predecessor. Um, here just a short motorway part where we go to 100 kilometers an hour or about 60 miles an hour. By the way, I can always just, when I press OK here, switch the speed to miles. That's, you know, pretty nice, especially if you have to switch between those areas or something. And of course, for car reviewers who do reviews for both Europeans and Americans and for all over the world. <laughs> so great feature for us here, near 63 miles an hour, 110, uh, sorry, 101 kilometers an hour. Setting the cruise control, that is working quite well too. Adaptive cruise control, not in this vehicle, but the normal cruise control so far doing quite good. You can also see it from this camera angle, how well you can just look at the side of the vehicle. That is so crucial when driving off-road. You can really see what obstacles are ahead. You even don't have to lean out of the window, you already see it. But then of course, if you lean out of the window, those very slim doors come even handier. That's really cool. The side mirrors deliver a very good view to the rear. And there's also the blind spot monitor. So when this car now is approaching me, I get the yellow triangle. And when I also set the turning indicator, then we also get the acoustic warning. That is very loud, by the way. Um, to my taste, a little bit too loud, but obviously I thought, you know, when you're driving a little bit faster and this car is not that silent anymore, then you might probably need it. Interesting also, between those street driving modes. At the moment, I'm in just the rear drive mode and that was recommended before this new generation. And the thing I feel here is, of course, you're just getting pushed from the rear. And to me, in city driving, that feels a little bit more agile. I feel that the car is a little bit more silent because um, no power is transported to the front wheels, no, um, you know, center differential is working or something and you feel that the front axle is a little bit lighter. So for city driving, I prefer this rear-wheel drive mode indeed. But then on the motorway, you sometimes have the feeling that the car is getting a little bit less um, stable because when you're driving a little bit faster and with those tires, which are, well, they are the street version, but they are still off-roadish if you compare it to normal car tires, and then you have to correct the steering quite a lot. And when you then go to this four-wheel drive mode, it will improve it a little bit because you're also getting pulled from the front. So that's what I felt. So I would still prefer the rear-wheel drive mode in the city and on the motorway, I would go to this um, 4H auto mode, which you can keep the car in now. So I've tested it both with rear-wheel drive, drive, drive and just with the auto all-wheel drive. There is no friction or something, or you feel that you can't do it um, because of a lock differential or something. 
for, for example, when you turn the steering wheel all the way around when you're standing still and then parking in and out, you can do this in the 4H auto mode. That's not possible, that's a big change. And of course, that's pretty cool. Only if you go then to the next, this 4H part-time mode, that is then a fixed permanent all-wheel drive. There you should not use it on the street. You will destroy your car basically, not directly, but you know, it's not good you know, for, for friction and um, you know, for durability of the car and so on. No high speed, no big we uh, steering wheel moves with it because that's also then with a center differential lock. It's a little bit misleading that this 4H part-time mode is called part-time because it's n in no way part-time. And everyone is writing and telling that and I wonder why did they name it part-time because it's 4H full-time, you know? <laughs> I don't get it. And the thing is also between the auto, the 4H auto mode, which you can drive on the street and the 2H, you can switch to about like think about 72 kilometers. So that should be like about 50 miles an hour. You can switch just while driving here, pull the other gear lever. Now we're in the 4H auto mode. That's no problem for the car, just not if you drive too fast. And of course, if you go to um, the, the gear reduction mode, if you have, um, you know, like here, the version with gear reduction as well, then you have to be standing still and put the car in neutral because it's like, like a second gearbox that's working, you know. So also when standing still, I can go back to the rear wheel drive mode. And again, it's somehow just more fun to drive with rear wheel drive. Uh, that's not only something that is counting for sports cars, also somehow for here, but I will switch it around again when we're on the motorway and I tell you something about the difference. In general, this driving feeling is also so special because you have the great upright seating position, you have a good overview to everyone, you, you look down on everyone. To the front, well, this is a little bit caged in, it's dark on top, you see also on camera how dark it is here um, with the closed top and this very small windshield. And you look down to this front hood, it always makes every ride to you know, the next baker or something a special experience unlike you would have just with the car that you bought just for getting from A to B. This is really unique. Also with the dashboard layout you see, even if you're just driving here on the road, you feel like, wait a minute, when's my next off-road experience beginning? <laughs> so that's the great thing about this vehicle. And as you know, I'm also an off-road driver, two-wheel and four-wheel. I just, just love the stuff. And so I really appreciate the features that this car is having. Also, by the way, um, when you look to the rear there with the upright windows, you can see everything very well. And then you also have the blind spot monitor if you like that. Um, so some more assistance systems here for this generation. That's also the advantage of modernizing everything with this vehicle. Back to those tires. They have a lot of rubber there left, especially here with the winter tires. And so it is a little bit shaky on the road so you don't get a stiff experience of course an off-road suspension that's really cool so the car is very comfortable in the ride it doesn't shake up too much that's okay you know when you turn the steering wheel mm, but sometimes on the road especially if there are some road ruts you feel the car is searching its way on its own and you have to work against it and that's actually desired when driving off-road, that the car searches its own best way through the mud. That's also the reason why those off-road steerings are not that progressive. So you will also see when I'm going in the next roundabout very soon, I have to turn the steering wheel a lot. It's light to turn, but you have to steer a lot. And that is desired when driving off-road because when off-roading, you don't need sudden steering wheel movements. And you also want the car to search its own way a little bit. However, when street driving at higher speeds, that can be a little bit annoying. Yesterday I was on a longer motorway trip and also with higher speed and it was very, very windy. And I was constantly working the steering wheel to keep the car in lane. And that can be a little bit exhausting. This 2.2 liter diesel we drive here today, let's accelerate 80 kilometers or from 50 miles to 100 kilometers, let's go. Yeah, it was a little bit too early for me, but almost so. But that, you see it also on the camera, that was pretty quick. So even at some higher speeds, this small engine still got power reserve. So 
Acceleration figure, as I told you earlier, below 10 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. That's totally okay. So you get along with that. And the consumption is also totally okay considering the size of the vehicle. So that's uh, about 8 liters on 1 kilometers for motorway driving and 10 liters on 1 kilometers for city driving with more stop and go. That would be 29 mpg for the motorway and 23 mpg for the city driving. And something in between we also scored recently with the Audi Q8 for example. And they are both approximately the same size as for the length, you know. So um, can't complain about that. Of course, this one has not the best wind efficiency, but considering it is super unwind efficient, that's still okay somehow then. It is also windy again today outside a little bit, but you also already hear the wind noises here coming from when I'm driving a little bit faster here. And when I'm now, um, well, at 100, I cannot switch then between the, the, the two modes. But when I drive a little bit slower, I can. And I said on the motorway, I felt that it would be somewhat better to stay in this 4H auto mode. It would be a little bit more suitable because it keeps the car a little bit calmer. So when I'm here, for example, accelerating now, also the front wheels get some of the drivetrain, and then they're stabilizing the car just a little bit. So long motorway trips, at higher speed are not necessarily that much fun, but you sit upright, have this cool off-road seating position, that makes it fun, but not the driving characteristics with the, um, you know, long to, yearn, long to turn steering wheel, the very soft tires, a lot of rubber, so that's not street optimized, you just have to realize that for sure. Um, if you have lower highway speeds, if you're thinking about most highways in the US and so on, that's actually no problem then. It's more, you know, a German thing. Then again, 100 is still, or 100 kilometers or 60 miles, is still something okay for this vehicle. Everything above that gets a little bit uncomfortable. See here how far I have to turn the steering wheel for this roundabout. But also check out how stable the car remains. As for the shaking here also when I'm turning to the other side again. So it doesn't lean too much to the sides. That's actually pretty good. Also when I try to induce it like this here, little slalom that's okay from the suspension but the reason is of course always since the steering wheel is set up in this off-road way what I'm doing here now in a car that reacts more progressive as for the steering I would shake it up a little bit more because the wheels are turned up steeper um, I'm now going back to this 4 edge auto mode again by the way to accelerate out of this corner and then I feel that also the front wheels are pushing me and that is delivering more understeer. I'm going to the outside of the corner there. So that again proves my point that as long as you're at slower speeds, the rear wheel drive is somehow cooler, somehow sportier to drive. You have less understeer for that. But I think it's good, especially when you have, you know, a little bit more fierce condition or snow, where you're not, like, not super slow snow, but also where you drive at normal speeds or something then you have the possibility to, to also have an all-wheel drive mode for the city or for road driving and I think that's definitely a good accomplishment. We, you, you will actually use it and also quite a lot depending on the, the region, the area you're living in. So it is still a lot of fun to drive this vehicle because it is so unique but definitely if you feel the faster you go the less optimized this car is for that, of course. So this is one of the very rare cars where this true off-road character is so significant that you also have to make some compromises at, at some point. If you think about which car could be compared in driving this one, the Land Rover Defender is at the moment not built anymore. There's the small Suzuki Jimny. You will also see that on Auto Fuel and Full Review. Um, that's a different segment. However, if you think about the short Wrangler or something, then <laughs> it comes a little bit closer, but not that. And then there's, of course, the Mercedes G-Class, which also still has this very characteristic building style. It is um, more comfortable to drive. It is actually also better in high speed. Also creates some, some wind noise, then that's, that's clear. But um, this one here feels definitely more off-roadish and rougher. Although both G-Class and Jeep Wrangler are, of course, very much off-road capable. And 
Well, if you spec this very vehicle here to the max, so as we drive this car here today, this one here is it's like 61,000 euros, and that's really expensive. The G class is, of course, even more expensive. But then, if you think about some base versions of the Wrangler, and especially for our friends over in the US, you can maybe stay like at about thirty thousand dollars or something. And then, of course, you can think about getting three or four Jeep Wrangler for one Jeep class. G class, you know. Only if you're here in Europe and then go for the high spec version of this one versus a low spec version of the G class, then there would some you know, just be a difference of about twenty, thirty thousand or something. In other cases, the difference is of course really massive, and then I really have to say, if you think, oh, this G-Class ride is so great, and well, the Jimny is too small for you, or you don't want to, you know, drive that particular car, or you want something more, then you can actually also get this great off-road experience while driving, even on the street with a Jeep Wrangler. I would just then recommend to go for maybe for a little lower spec version not to boost the price that that up, you know, because then for such an expensive price I would probably get, you know, a more comfortable SUV for also a little bit faster driving on the motorway or something. Um, of course, even Jeep have, have an extensive lineup for that too. Um, but this one here, I think, as, as soon as I would have some off-road situations at some point and I really need to trust in the vehicle and have some really rough situations, then it was, this one would be very suitable. However, if you are a true fan and think, yeah, you know, I'm not going off-roading that often, but still, so cool to drive this car. <laughs> I don't care if it's loud on the motorway. Then it's of course still the car for you. And I think that's also what they're still aiming at. So with this version here, also in the high uh, high spectrum, they also want to, you know, want to offer some customers to have this road lifestyle SUV where you say, yeah, okay, I know it's a little bit whatever if I don't use it for off-roading so much. But still, it's somehow cool. And so if I want to, want to spend my money, I just spend my money on that. And, you know, consumption-wise, see, it's, of course, less than consumption if you just drive a small car, that's for sure. But if you compare other big SUVs or something, this one then is not especially, you know, like so high in the consumption. Talking about the 2.2 liter diesel here, which is the main engine for Europe. It's of course different when you think about the big petrol engine or something, they will get, uh, burn more fuel. And there will also be a big difference to a Mercedes G-Class, because we've been testing that one as a diesel uh, recently, and even as a diesel, I was like, consumption, like, what is going on here? It was like, wow, off the charts, basically. So, and back to some more driving impressions here. Again, you know, due to this indirect steering, you can keep the car a little bit calmer than so that does fit to the vehicle. However, I'm not too unsatisfied with the steering since um, it's still light to control and there's not so much happening at the wheels directly, which is again intended, but the steering wheel also does not have any dead zone. So you do have a feeling for the steering at all times and can apply very precise steering commands. Do you hear that by the way? So when I'm accelerating in this 4H auto mode and I have the four-wheel drive then activated, I somehow have the feeling that, that is then louder, somehow as you would hear what's going on in the front there. If I go back to this two-wheel drive mode and accelerate out of this hill and then listen again, I don't know if it's just me, or you can also hear that on camera, but I fear that the two-wheel drive mode and the rear-wheel drive mode is more silent in general. And again, I think it's just a little bit more agile to drive around with that one. So what do you think about road driving the Jeep Wrangler here in the Sahara version? Of course, the one thing I really would love to do with this car is take it out to Moab, Utah, and really drive those slick rock trails and or maybe pink sand tunes also in Utah. Um, playing in the sand with this vehicle is really great. If you also would like to see that, because here where I, where I am at the moment, there's no suitable off-road trail which 
you know, which would be A, legal, and B, even be somewhat to a challenge of this car. This car, you know, is, is laughing at any semi-off-road <laughs> situations. So the only chance is to go somewhere else and do that. And if you want to see that, please put it in the comments and just say, um, maybe we can address it also at the, uh, at the Jeep press department that they should organize a trip um, to Utah for us with this car and you can see it there as well. So um, just tell me in the comments, Thomas, I would love to see you driving it in more Utah. And please tell that, please tell, please tell Jeep they should uh, organize something like that. And I can just gather those screenshots and send them to, to Jeep then when we can maybe do that. I would really uh, love to do that with, with you together on board, of course, behind the camera there. That would be really amazing. So what's your take on the Jeep Wrangler here in the new generation? And if you are a Jeep Wrangler owner, please share your comments, your experience there too. I love to read some customer comments. Maybe, you know, experience with reliability and also your on-road both and off-road experience with the Jeep Wrangler. Really looking forward to read those. Well, it has been a lot of fun for me today with the Jeep Wrangler and this new generation is for sure a little bit more normal car-like as for the driving experience because it's more silent, it's a little bit easier to ride, to drive and so on. You get more infotainment system, blah, blah, blah. But it still stays with a true characteristic of the Jeep Wrangler. You can see it here on the exterior. It's still a very rugged car. The interior also with the design still very off-road capable. Just when you look at the side of the window, that's the thing, you know, you can see all of the obstacles and so on. And funny also that you can remove this hardtop. This has remained the same. A little bit easier here now in the new generation. But as I said earlier, you can also go for other versions if you appreciate the open top feeling a little bit more and want to, you know, be a little bit more flexible, for example, with a soft top or the dual top. The room that's offered in the interior is also quite okay. And you have to think about in the five door version, it's really already a big SUV if you compare it to other modern SUVs. The thing is that when you go higher speeds, then you feel this off-road character. So this is a disadvantage, of course, driving on higher speeds on the street. But then again, this one really stays off-road capable all the time. So is it also a lifestyle SUV? Well, somewhat if you think about the fun factor because it is really, really unique and a lot of fun in driving because you always think, oh, your next off-road experience is, you know, maybe about to start. But you have, of course, to live with the off-road features it comes when you go for street driving. So it's for sure pro and con. But that's why this vehicle is bought by enthusiasts who don't care if it's a little bit, you know, wobbly at 120 kilometers an hour on the motorway. Therefore, you can still go up, you know, maybe those logs behind us. Shall we try that out? <laughs> and I hope to see you then sometime next soon at the real off-road driving episode of this one. That would be amazing. So, thank you so much for tuning in to Autofuel. What do you think about the newest generation of the Jeep Wrangler?